Should you buy your multifamily as your first property? We're going to find out. I'm Ashley Kerr. Welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, three times a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to kickstart your investing journey. Today's rookie investors are a husband and wife duo that purchased a two-family home in a very expensive market. But they dove in head first, got their hands dirty, and did the hard work for a bigger, brighter future. Today on the episode, we're going to discuss how they acquired the deal, what you should know about a 203K loan, how to do a live-in flip, and how to deal with tenants when you live under the same roof. So Noreen and Derek, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Hi, thank you. So to kind of jump into it, Derek, I heard that before you met Noreen, you had already bought and sold your first property, but then you started renting again as a renter. What made that decision happen? Yeah, good question. Uh, So I went in on a a single family home. It was a 4-2 with my cousin. And it was during the time when Obama was giving out that $8,000, $10,000 tax credit for first time home buyers. So we took advantage of that. It was a distressed property. Um, we rented out two of the rooms to college students. So it was like 500 a room and we were on the hook for 1181, you know, and that doesn't include taxes. Um, so it, my uncle said, this is the cheapest you're ever going to live. Well, surprise. He was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Only by a little bit. He was still wrong. So we did that. I think I had to stay for three years or four years. Um, and at the four year mark, I just decided, okay, let, let's part ways while, you know, uh, family relationships still good. Um, cause that's more important, you know, than a deal or that type of thing. And I started renting again and I moved in with my sister and we rented for a year. And as I was paying the rent, I'm like, this is a lot worse than owning and having <laughs> the, the opposite. And, and what was worse about it? Was it more just the mental aspect of I'm giving somebody else my money and I'm not getting, you know, equity or was it you're submitting maintenance requests and things aren't getting done? <laughs> what was kind of the reasoning you decided you didn't want to do that anymore? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say equity, because every time you make your payment, you know, you're paying a thousand bucks, but you're getting back 800, you know, just to pull a number, 600 bucks. So when you're paying rent, you're not getting anything back. That's going all to the landlord. And now that we're landlords, we see that side of it, you know, even more clearly. Um, It's kind of hidden when you're renting that you're paying like, oh, I'm getting something, a place to live. But you are missing out on that on the equity building. And then so had you met Noreen at this point when you decided you're going to go and buy your first property or your next property, I should say? So I you... think so. Yeah, because I invited you over. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I had seen the house that they had. And um, shortly after we met, Derek wanted to sell out of it. And I was like, why? Like, you're living for nothing. Like, here I am living in Astoria, which is a great neighborhood, but I'm paying rent in New York. Like, everyone I know would rather own something than rent something, right? So I was like, what are you doing? But it turned out that was in our favor eventually, because we were eventually able to get the loan that we got later. But for a while, I was like, why why would you sell out of this? But it it made sense in the long run. She's like, this is why I'm dating you. You own a house. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I was like, why are you going backwards? Um, But after we met, um, I think after we got married, I think we started talking again about, you know, investing and homeownership, right? We started um, our married life, you know, renting because we had to start somewhere, right? So we started renting. um, And we very quickly said, let's get out of this as fast as we can, you know, Thankfully, we had um, the finances to buy a house and we said, let's buy a house. And then we started listening to, well, Dare, I should say Derek started listening to Bigger Pockets before I did. Yeah. Yeah. So we were renting an apartment in the city. It was like 1400 a month. One bedroom, a had two windows, which was nice because you could get across. We had a corner. Some of them it's you just don't deal. get that. Um, and every day was 45 minutes on the subway into the city. I was working in the city at the time and we did that for a year. And the 45 minutes was a great time to listen to podcasts. So Bigger Pockets, I listened to. Uh, Dole Roller was another one that I listened to. There were a couple I was kicking around, just investing. What are people doing? And one day at lunch, I'm talking with Noreen on the phone and she's like, you know, what do you want to buy? And it was like pulling teeth for me. It's hard for me to say what I really want a lot of the times for some reason. But um, Opposites attract because I'm really, really vocal about what I want. (laughs) She's like, what do you want? I said, what do you want? And I was like, a multifamily. It just came out with that. And it it was the truth. And here we are. So what were some of the things you did to prepare yourself for investing in multifamily? Like when you splurted that out and you decided, okay, we're going for multifamily, what were some of the next step you you did to actually 
you know, be able to take action on a multifamily property? Oh, well, th- well, either way, you're buying a house, right? So you need to take the action that you would if you're going to buy a single family house or a condo or whatever you want to live in. Um, so we got our ducks in a row financially and found a realtor and um, put aside our down payment in a nice account that we wouldn't touch. Yeah. And then this, the location. So one of the yeah. biggest things for us was we wanted to be able to ha- go into New York City because that's where Noreen's work is. And so we said 10 miles, 10 minutes, 10 minute walk to a train station that can, has access to the city. And that really limited that settled no to a lot of stuff, which makes it a lot easier to look when you're not looking through thousands of listings. You're only looking through hundreds or however many, <laughs> a lot less. Right. It's easier. And then you can say yes more easily. Right. And we also, you know, we had looked around Queens in our neighborhood that we were living. We were living in Woodside. It's a fine neighborhood, right? I had moved from a story to Woodside and um, we realized for our budget, we could get like a studio co-op in Woodside, Queens, or we could, you know, swing a multifamily house in New Jersey. So we were like, well, I said, I said to myself, Noreen, you never thought you'd say this, but you're going home to New Jersey, right? Because I'm from here. Right. Um, and my parents long ago moved out of the city and got, you know, got a house in suburbia or whatever. And I was like, oh, bridge and tunnel, here I go. But as long as I have a train... I said, as long as I have a train and a bus, I actually have a train and a bus. I said, then I could do it. Right. And we would hop in the car with your mom and she would drive us around to a couple of properties. And as we're going, the the value was kind of like, it's going to be over 300,000. Like I was used to like 150, 200, but then just looking to, you're going to get something that's not really that great, not turnkey. You're not moving in. Oh, this was not a turnkey situation yeah. at all. And these are 2016 numbers for anyone who's listening and saying, oh, you know, 300 grand in New York. Well, that's it's eight, a deal eight now. years ago. That's that's a total <laughs> steal right now. Um, tell me if you find one, please. Yeah. Um, so the other thing we did is we looked at, um, you know, what are the taxes in the different towns that we're looking? Because in New Jersey, our tax, our property tax numbers are quite high. Um, I think they're highest in the nation Meaning still. Like 12 grand a year to 20 grand, 24 grand a year. Yeah, especially in a multifamily, right? Because it's a, a bigger property, you get taxed more. Um, so we X'd out all the towns with the highest taxes and we X'd out all the towns that we wouldn't feel comfortable in for safety reasons. And we X'd out the towns that didn't have a train in both directions uh, at all times of day. And um, we ended up in like three neighborhoods and we narrowed it down to where we wanted to go. And we said, that's it. And we'll say no to everything else. Yeah, it was like Lindhurst. Garfield, Harris, Rutherford, there's Garfield. a government subsidy for taxes here. I yeah. Think it was. Just I try to drum up is, but... industrial workers. Yeah. What a great roadmap you guys just put together for somebody who's looking to buy their first property, but doesn't know exactly what neighborhood they want to be in yet. Is to like, okay, you could say you want to be in, you know, Buffalo. Okay. There's lots of neighborhoods, just like in every single city that that's not niche enough. You need to go in deeper. And exactly we did take a map and just X out as to like, okay, not here, not here, not here. And putting that in. But also you guys did a really good job of defining your criteria of not only just the market, but you wanted a multifamily. You wanted it 10 minutes walking within a train station. And how you said, you know, instead of looking at thousands of deals, we were looking at a hundred. And when you limit the amount of deals you're actually, or the amount of leads, I should say, you're looking at coming in, you can spend a more quality time analyzing those deals because you're not overwhelmed where there's something that you guys discovered in your listing where maybe if you were inundated with a thousand leads, you would have missed it. But what was that one thing that was listed incorrectly on the house that you ended up purchasing. Oh yeah, so so we were finding properties faster than our realtor was, right? Because we're we're our own client, right? Because he's busy. He's busy. He's got, he's he's popular. Right? He's a nice guy. So um, we found our property listed as a single family on HUD's home store, and it's actually a multifamily. So if you're searching, don't search your criteria too niche because you might be. A, a, eliminating something by accident that that's actually the thing for you often like people will reverse like bedrooms and bathrooms like if you're looking for a three two sometimes they'll say it's a two three or something like that so just a little quick tip like sometimes it's just listed wrong yeah and that actually happens quite common i've heard lots of stories as to uh, like something that's listed as you know an office but it super easily has like maybe a closet on the other side of it you just have to put the door to the other side or something like that that there's even even not listed incorrectly but opportunities within the home that you don't see in the pictures unless you go and actually walk the property so you found this on the HUD website. Can you explain what this is? Okay, so the HUD home store 
housing and urban development, I think is what it stands for. Um, I'm sure somebody on the internet will correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so this is, it's a government website and um, it is very much a government website in that regard, though they did have a nice update recently. Um, and uh, it is a, a listing. You can search listings on it, right? They have other programs that, that they have on their website, but you can search listings on it. And these are HUD owned, government owned properties that are foreclosed upon. So they're foreclosures um, of somebody who had a government loan and they didn't pay it. And now it's for sale. Um, so a lot of these properties are distressed a lot of them have been uninhabited for a year or two or five or 10, who knows? Um, and they were unloved and not cared for because the people who didn't have the money to pay their mortgage are also the same people who didn't have the money to upkeep the property. Um, at least that's what we saw in our property. Maybe not for all at HUD houses, but that's what we saw for ours. Um, the nice advantage, if there's an advantage on a HUD house is that they're often open to owner occupants first. So on our property, that was a five day period. I, it can vary. I don't know what the rules are now. They change them a lot, um, but for us it was five days. So it went up on the market on a Wednesday and the bids were due like on a Monday. And we saw it, I think Thursday night, we found it and we looked at it on Saturday and we had to get our bid in by Sunday night because on Monday it opened up to investors. And when, when we say investors, I mean like piranhas in our neighborhood. Like, cause this- <laughs> We're in a multifamily This universe. is a multifamily yeah. neighborhood. Yeah. There are a lot of people around here who know how to fix a house and fix it quickly. Like if we see a house that's like a little bit ignored around here, we're like, oh, next week it'll be two. And it really is like they're, people are tearing down houses, yeah. building up. Contractors place. live here. It's yeah. So being owner occupants, we were able to bid before they all got here. And we did a funny game. Your dad's like, we all sat around the dinner, uh, dining room table. He's like, everyone write down what your bid would be. And we folded it up and put him into a hat. And then we just pulled them out just for like the fun of it. Because if we, <laughs> if we didn't win on Monday and no one ever knows like what's the magic number that HUD wants, right? If we didn't win on the Monday, we might lose our chance. So we, we bid a little healthier than I think I would in retrospect. But the other thing is we, you know, we were pushing up the end of our lease and we didn't want to continue renting. And we said, look, the difference in 27 grand on our bid is like 30 bucks a month on our mortgage payment. And we were like, we can totally swing 30 extra dollars a month on a mortgage payment to get this house. Right, get the house. Um, the object of the game was just get the house as soon as we could. So whose number was it that you actually put the bid in? Who's... <laughs> I, I don't it think was. it was... My dad bid high, so he was out. Um, we were like, we're not bidding, we're not paying over 300 for this we house. We followed some guy online. I we, was... we were, okay, so so the day the bid, like we went home and when I tell you we read everything available on bigger pockets on, yeah. I think it was invest for more has a great resource yeah. on, on HUD houses. We read our faces off about how to bid in this process. We had knew, we knew nothing about it. So I said, look, reading's free. Let's find out what we can. And we did. And um, I think I think it was my number that we settled on. Sure. 287.5 was where we settled. And then the 203K. So Derek, do you want to explain what a 203K loan is? Sure. I can take a shot at it. Noreen knows more, but oh, then Noreen, you take this question. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I mean, the basic concept thank is you, you, you can't move into the house because the water heat isn't available. So there's no certificate of occupancy. You have to fix up the house enough so that you can move into it and it becomes livable. So that's the premise of this. And then it allows you to take out your loan or your mortgage. Um, it's a construction loan on top of your mortgage is the short thing. So if you, if you just, you know, bought a house and then said, Oh, I need to take out a construction loan. You'd probably get some, you know, 15% rate or 20% or whatever construction loans go for now, which is probably astronomical. Um, but your two or three K is the same rate as your mortgage. It just becomes part of your mortgage. So our rate at the time, I think was 4%. I'm sorry, anyone listening. That's not what rates are right now. Um, so our mortgage and our construction loan all together came to, I think 308 was the number. Yep. Um, so we bought, we bid at 287.5 and then our 203K costs to fix our house came to 308. And all of that was part of the mortgage. What are some pros and cons of doing the 203K loan through your experience of the process? Wow, I just had a lot of emotions surge through my veins listening to that question. <laughs> Would you like to vent right now about the process? I mean, I'm not gonna mention any names about our contractor. Um, so the, so the pros, okay. So the pros are you can get a house that if you don't have the cash to pay for an uninhabitable house, you can still get your house and you can get it in, in your, and you can mortgage it. Right. So this is a house that ordinarily was uninsurable. This ensures that you can get the house and you can get insurance and all that good stuff. Um, con big con is that there's a lot of paperwork and it's 
tear your hair out kind of paperwork and your contractor has to do a lot of it. Some contractors are very good. Some cra contractors are not very good. We actually had a contractor who knew the paperwork, but then he knew his toolbox. Yeah. So I, I don't know which is better. We ended up basically fixing everything he touched in our house, but we got into our house in six weeks and for two or three K stuff, that's actually pretty quick. You know, we had the, the laundry list of things we had to fix included the both boilers, both hot water heaters, mm -hmm. windows, uh, a roof, a portion of the roof. Um, there was a staircase with a three foot drop to the side door that had no stair. Like, I mean, it was really, truly an uninhabitable house. And we, we could not turn on the water at all in the whole home buying process. So when they say like, oh, we need to test the water pressure. We're like, can you do it? And they were like, nope. So we're like, all right, let's just assume we have to fix all of the plumbing in the entire house. And that's what we did. Eventually, we've pretty much done every inch of it. And how did you guys go about estimating that rehab cost? When you're sitting at the table writing out your bids, did you have an idea at that time what the rehab was going to cost and base your numbers off of that? So the contractor did that. Okay. And I will say he was pretty accurate other than a, a leak or two that they didn't foresee. Um, he did do that. And they do make you do a 10% contingency, which is, I think, a really good idea, no matter what kind of reno you're doing, is to add 10 or 20%, but um, <laughs> 2 or 3K makes you do 10 um, to your top number. So that we ended up using that 10%, and that's what it's for, right? For something unforeseen. Um, so that the, the con is definitely the paperwork, but the pro is that you get the house. At six weeks, it's pretty good to do a full house rehab. <laughs> no, hold on. No, hold on. <laughs> Six weeks got us in the door, like eating Chinese food on the floor next to the one working heater. Like this, we did not do, this was not a Joanna Gaines renovation. Okay. <laughs> Let me curb expectations here. We were not screaming, you know, clutching our pearls saying, oh my gosh, what a beautiful house. We were saying, oh wow, it's nice and warm for the first time ever in this house. Well, plus even with the, you know, the negatives of a contractor that wasn't great with tools, uh, he did hire subs that were great. Yes. And we made it uh, somehow we got the, his phone number plumber and he was star, you know, in, yeah. in fixing things that were beyond, uh, well, Noreen's dad's a carpenter, fifth generation carpenter. So he skills that, you know, maybe were less, you know, he didn't want to do them or, or it was electric, you know, it, getting those contractors yeah. that are good. And you look at them and say, you did good work. I'm happy to pay you. And I want you to keep working on this, you know, or work on the next property. So yeah, we definitely got his, we literally, it was like yeah. whatever dating tactics people use to get someone's number. We were all about that with our plumber. <laughs> <laughs> if he wanted a cup of coffee, I was like, Hey, do you want another cup of coffee? Like, yeah, we're on it. So you mentioned that Noreen's dad was a carpenter and has contracting experience. What about you two? Did you have any knowledge of construction and going into a rehab and what to expect with the process? I would say generally, no. I mean, Noreen grew up with it. It would be a weekend and eight o'clock oh, yeah. in the morning and right. the hammers are going, you know. Yeah. Um, so she had more experience, let's just say that way, than I did. Um, obviously, I've you know, got the strength or whatever and quick to learn. So happy to help. Um and learn as you go. You know, we end up doing drywall ourselves and, you know, doing some of the plaster and painting actually quite a bit of it, you know, later on on our just floor. just about everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you start to see it and you get exposed to it and you're like, wow, this isn't really that hard. This isn't rocket science. Did any point in time that put any strain on your relationship of like, okay, you're going and moving into a renovation together. You're having troubles with your contractor. At any point, did this cause any strange? And what's your tips for any couple that's going to be living in a renovation? Well, you have a lot of stuff on <laughs> making a makeshift kitchen. <laughs> you know, when you're redoing yeah, your yeah, kitchen, yeah. you aren't cooking in it. So I think, so my, so I think it brought us together more than it strained it. Um, you can, you can take an adventure and I truly think this is an adventure, this house, right? Um, you can take it and say, oh my gosh, it's going to be so stressful. I just wanted my nice house. Or you can say, look, we are newly married right at the time we didn't have kids. And we said, this is going to be interesting. We're going to have fun with this. We're going to take it like an adventure. So when I tell you for the first week we lived here, I washed dishes in my bathtub and bathroom <laughs> sink. I sure did you know, because we had six sinks and only one of them worked or whatever, you know, and you just say like, all right, this is temporary. Um, and, and I'm with my favorite person that I would ever do anything like this with. Um, the only thing crazier I think we've done is have children. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, in terms of tips for other couples, I would say, um, hold hands and do it together. 
even if you don't know what the heck you're doing, find people who do um, say yes when they offer to help you um, go help other people and you'll, you'll figure out how to do this and you'll, you'll learn about houses and um, you know, and on, on the days that are long and you're literally covered in plaster. And, you know, I think there was one day Derek looked at me and he was like covered in, <laughs> he was like sanding um, drywall and he was looked like mean, a zombie. He looked like a zombie. <laughs> And he came in and on the radio, our wedding dance song managed to pop up. And I just looked at him and started crying. I was like, this is... Yeah, here we go. It's it's in, in the weirdest, craziest way. It's kind of a dream come true, right? Here we are. We're doing life together. That's what we said we would do. Um, so any couple, you know, you know, find your common values. Start there. Draw on that. And do life together, even when it's crazy (laughs) messy and living in a rehab that's it that's it so let's kind of wrap up that property as to how long did it actually take to finish the rehab did you refinance the property and what's the you know final numbers on the deal so we we renovated the second floor first um we bought we closed on the house in october of 2016 we had the second floor kitchen bath and you know the rest of the apartment um, done. We gutted the kitchen and bath and one bedroom, and then you know fixed up the rest of it. By and we had it rented out by June of 2017. Um, at that point, we refinanced in September of that year um, to get out of our PMI. Right, so we only put three and a half percent down because it was an FHA loan that was ten grand, um, but we were paying over two hundred bucks a month on PMI because of the low down payment. And the only way to get out of it was to refinance. Some situations you can pay your way out of PMI. In this situation on that particular loan, we could not. So the only way out was to refinance. And we said, heck yes, that's what we're gonna do. Um, So we did. And then in 2020, we refinanced again, just because rates were so low. um, And we took advantage of that because we were so early in the loan that Derek did all that math and it made good sense. So you got 4% on your first loan. What was the interest rate on your second loan to make us all (laughs) squirm? I think it was 3.65 on the second loan and now we're down to under three. We're at like 2.95 right now. So I'm so sorry, anyone (laughs) who's shopping right now. (laughs) But it was 2020. Like we refinanced in our shed on the pouring rain, you know, (laughs) it was a very 2020 thing to do. And then just recap for us real quick. What was the purchase price, the total cost of the rehab? And then what is the property worth now? So we purchased at 287,500. Add on to that the 203K, that first loan was at 308. The purchase price total was technically 308. We spent probably between the second floor and we eventually did our first floor and some other things, the exterior. Oh gosh, our Mason made a lot of money. Um, We eventually spent probably about 115 grand on the house from top to bottom. And that does not include all the sweat hours and all of the right. um, friends that, you know, we had a lot of help. We had friends come and help us paint. We had, my dad was here all the time. Yeah, Noreen's like, for my birthday, we're doing a demo smashing party. I'm having a birthday smash, emphasis on smash. Yeah. Who wants to come? And people, like my brother and sister-in-law, shout out, they came. And uh, my dad was here and and his buddy Frankie was here all the time helping us tape. And Derek's cousins came down. I, we had friends help us paint. And um, so, yeah, so all of that is not included in that 115. Right. Our plumber's gone to Disney World quite a bit. And what do you think the value of the property is now today? So we can officially say we reappraised in 2020 at 570. I would say it's healthily above 600 by this point. Um, a two bedroom house very close to here just went for 720. And I, if you paid that for that house, please tell me who you are. Um, I just, that's a lot. It's a lot. It's great. The market's gone crazy. Yeah, it here. doesn't make any sense. It's, but, um, but we're, ha- we're not mad about it. <laughs> and what about your living costs now? So you're, you're still house hacking in the property? Yes, we are. Okay. So what is the other tenant paying in rent and what do you actually pay a month to live in the property? There's a little bit of a story there. So it started, we started renting at 1800, which was 17. awesome. 1700. 1700 okay. in 2017 which is awesome. And we, one of the mistakes we made was we kept renting at that rate. You know, we're like, wow, this is great. Look how we're living. And then when we decided, you know, let's start upping it. It felt weird, you know, because it was the first tenant that was still living. There's like, well, why are you changing this now? So there's a little bit of difficulty with that. You know, I was reading stuff and reading, seeing things online. And it's like, you know, this is a business. It's not a charity. So you kind of need to do that. And it's okay to get turnover because of it. So there was a little bit of a mind shift. And we're like, okay, so now we consistently do something, you know, bump that rent up a little bit. It seems like a lot of 
folks who are in this, they're just like, let's keep the tenants, less turnover, less work, and you know, a couple less dollars. So, um, but now it's up to twenty one hundred a month. Um, we originally quote charged ourselves rent as just a way of keeping our finances organized, right? We'd move money over to our, our rental account. Um, we originally charged ourselves around a thousand or 1200 just to build up a, a, a fund, like a, a, a separate account for, for this house for capital expenses and maintenance. And we've had to use it. Right. Um, so we keep that money aside, but now we've, we've been nice to ourselves now and we're kind of enjoying the fruits of those labors. And now we charge ourselves charge ourselves 343 but really we only have to come up with 43 bucks yeah it's amazing it's kind of nice so noreen and derek you've rented out your property now what has the experience been like house hacking with your tenants living now you got you guys in the first floor or the second floor we're on the first floor okay so your tenants living above you yes with our tenants living right upstairs you know, I will say for the most part, it's been a positive experience. You know, everyone has their horror stories and we have them too about um, tenants and, you know, just how has, house hacking goes. But um, those days are very, very few compared to all the good ones. Um, I'd say there's like maybe five days I can really say like, ah, I wanted to pull my hair out. And um, all the other several hundred thousand are pretty good. In our experience. In our, in, <laughs> in our experience. Now, I will say um, tenant choice is everything. Tenant choice will likely make or break your experience house hacking. If you're thinking about house hacking to anyone listening, like be prepared to have to wait for a good tenant because there's no undo button. Like it's, it's, it doesn't work like that with tenants. Um, especially not in New Jersey where it's a very tenant friendly state, you know, depending on your area, you might have a little more leeway than, than people on the East coast do. So what are some of the things you guys actually put into your lease agreement to kind of set that expectation of these are the way things go around here, <laughs> but in a nice way. Yeah. So um, actually, Bigger Parkers was a really good resource. There's a really uh, nice post somewhere about um, making a battle ready lease or something. And we definitely drew on that. Like no water beds. I wouldn't have thought of that, but who needs a water bed in the second floor unit above your head, right? Mm -hmm. Just stuff like that. There's things that I, I wouldn't think of, but somebody thinks is normal, right? And that person might be a renter. Um, we also have stuff about when it's okay to contact us. Um, and that was hard learned, not hard earned, but hard learned, um, because we had somebody like banging on our door at two in the morning, um, for something that really was not life threatening. <laughs> so what is your actual rule for that? I'd love to hear. I think it's nine, like 9 PM to 8 AM, unless your life is in danger. Like, please just wait till the morning to it needs call to us. Needs to be a real emergency. It needs to be a real Not life threatening that emergency. Technically, could wait, you know, until regular yeah. normal hours. Yeah, but like, if you're on fire, please let me know. <laughs> I'll help you out, right? Or call nine one one. Or yeah, do that, right? The landlord is not like I'm not your mom. Like, you know, you got to take care of yourself at some point. And then, what about having any kind of documentation? Like, instead of just your tenant constantly coming over and knocking on your door and saying, "Hey." you know, can you take care of this? Or, Hey, am I, you know, here's my rent. Do you have any kind of, you know, set standards as to this is what you, the process you have to follow to submit a maintenance request or to pay your rent? Yeah. One thing we learned with, with our first tenant, we had them come knocking on our door and, you know, give us the check. And we found that that often came with a story or oh, we're a couple hundred short and the paycheck next paycheck's Wednesday. Is that okay? And when you start doing that, we realize that you're legally start getting into some trouble because you allowed it before. Why aren't you allowing it now? And how come you're not extending it further or whatever the issues are? And we, the landlord's legal guide is a book that we were referencing. And Great book. so that prompted us to switch over to Cozy, which is now apartments.com to get payments. So all the payments are online. We don't have to be home to get them. You know, we could be on vacation mm -hmm. in Florida or elsewhere and we can see, is this payment coming in or is it not? And then... You want to speak to and me. also, I think that, you know, taking online payments is a really nice buffer um, between you and the tenant. Like for some reason, it just makes it less awkward when you're dealing with money. Money's emotional for a lot of people. Or overdrafts are a little bit late. Overdrafts. If you it's can late, add it more easily. You can automatically set um, a late fee if you need to and say, well, I'm sorry, tomorrow it's going to charge the late fee, right? It's the machine that's going to charge it. I'm not trying, you know. Um, so while it is, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're the ones that set it up, but it, it helps us follow the lease and not get emotional about it, especially when they're people that you know, like you see them when you check your mail right. and um, you know their kids' names. And 
Yeah. And I'm telling you face to face, like this is my situation. It's way harder to not like have some empathy. Yeah. 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 And the other thing I do is I, I'm, I'm kind of the main contact because I don't work full time. Right. So I am the one that does the interfacing with the tenants and I it's either text or email. So it's in writing. I can see when I can see what it said. I can reference it back. I can I can rough draft what I need to say and then edit it if I need to. I can run it by Derek before I send it. Um, God forbid it ever comes to something legal or serious. Um, there's 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 a whole paper trail, um, and that has been, I think, really good. And then you know, you know, somebody can't say, "Oh, I told you five times about this." Well, if you really only told me once about this, and I'm fixing it literally as we speak, then I'm fixing it. So back off. You know, I I love the documentation of getting things in a text or an email. And if we do have tenants call, our VA will add an activity into their tenant portal page saying so-and-so called at this time, this is what they said, or this is what the conversation was, you know, makes a note if there needs to be follow-up, whatever. But I also do the same thing for contractors. Um, Two is everything written. Like I had a roofer that asked, Hey, can you just call me? Because there was an issue with the building permit. And I said, no, please continue in email with everything. (laughs) And I would not get on the phone with them. I said, no, I prefer to have everything in writing. Please let's just continue the email communication. And I understand that it is easier sometimes to just get on the phone or whatever, but, um, I do prefer the having everything in right like documentation so that you can go back and reference it, especially if it is something that is already an issue. You want to have everything in writing in case it goes to litigation or whatever. But um, there's been countless times where I've been able to scroll back and screenshot and be like, actually, here it is. Here's what you said, you know. I hadn't thought of that for contractors. That's a really good idea. So along with Cozy that you're using, uh, which is now apartments.com for your property management, are there any other tools or software that you're using to manage your property right now? Excel. Yeah. We're basic. Look, we have one property, right? We're not scaling. You know, I know you have 10 or something properties, right? Um, We don't have that many, right? So it's for now, for us, Excel makes sense to us. And that's how we manage, you know, our property budget and all that kind of stuff. But it's, it's pretty basic. And is that how you're doing your bookkeeping too, is just tracking a, an Excel with the, the budget? Yeah. Yeah. From, from my line of work, I've always had to track my expenses. I'm in the arts, I'm a model. Um, so I've always had to, you know, keep my receipts and, you know, track when did I spend this and how much was it and what was it called? You know, where does it classify? So I've just, I just transferred that into real estate. So with living uh, next door to your tenant, do you have any crazy tenant stories that you'd like to to share with us? And sometimes on this episode, we do a horror story and not to scare people out of real estate investing, but to entertain, but also so that if this situation happens to them, that they know exactly how to handle it or at least what to expect. So it's not as scary of a scenario if it does happen. Yeah. We're laying in bed one night at nine o'clock. Actually, there are a few stories, but yeah. And there's... hold on, it's April of 2020. <laughs> I am sick. I am sick. I'm very, very, very sick. I was super, super, super sick at the very beginning of COVID, um, and I probably had COVID, but it was I was so sick I couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. Knock comes on the door, and I, Noreen wakes up first, and she's just like recovering, you know, whatever. And I'm like, oh, I've been reading stuff like Lou Brown trust. And like, you don't have to answer the, if someone knocks, once we answer the door, then you're answering the door, but you don't have to answer the door. So I'm kind of like, I'm just, I'm, well, let's not answer. It's two o'clock in the morning. We don't well, have to answer also, the door. Also, there's only one set of people that have access Keys, to yeah, our apartment right. door, right? Our house has a front door and then there are apartment doors behind it, right? So there's only one person that this could be. <laughs> You'll never guess. Um, but this was a really solid knock. I was like, this, I don't think that's, I don't think that's our tenant's knock. That's a I professional was, knock. This is a professional knock. Yeah. And I, and I thought to myself, maybe I should answer it. And then I thought, oh my gosh, Noreen, don't do that. That's so mean. You're totally sick right now. And there's a pandemic raging outside of your door. That would be terrible if you'd answer this door. So I, I looked at my phone and sure enough, it was our tenant. And I said, I'm very sorry, whatever it is, I'm not answering the door. I don't want to get you sick. Um, 
And they said, it's the police. <gasps> the heat is out. You need to do something about it. And I thought to myself, well, shoot, if my heat is out, I'd call a plumber, not the police. But so the ten, the they lost heat. Did they have any contact with you at all that, you know, maybe you were sleeping and missed the text or whatever? Did they even try to communicate with you first? I think they might have texted once or called once, but I didn't hear it because I keep my phone off at night. But did it, they didn't come down and knock at all, apparently. And they called the police. Wow. I can't believe that the police would actually respond. That's what I said. Don't they have better things to do and bigger fish to fry at two o'clock in the morning during a pandemic? Yeah. I just like can't believe that. God, I hope none of my tenants are listening. I mean, our plumbers are great responders. Like they get there really fast. That's also something, something else we put in our lease. Like if, if you have a rental, um, a maintenance request of any kind, please give us 24 hours before you start, you know, taking further action on, you know, and like, just give us a second, you know, right, and let maybe us we know. need to go get a part. Well, exactly too. And if they were the homeowner, it's, they're not going to be able to get anyone faster there than you are most likely, unless you really are dragging your feet. But um, yeah, I think that's one of the difficult things about being landlord is you do have to set that expectation of what is a reasonable time for this to be fixed. And I have learned that having a lot of communication with your tenant, if something is not being fixed, like communicating why, like, you know what? I am so sorry. There was actually an emergency at another property. I'm going to do this for you in the meantime, whether it's take money off their rent or, you know, maybe their fridge broke. I'm going to drop off, have somebody drop off a cooler with ice or whatever, you know, like having that communication and offering like a lot of times just taking some money off their rent is just like, or giving them a little rent credit goes such a long way and it's worth it for them to not get super disgruntled too. Right. And it's just, how would you want to be treated? You know, our, we actually had a fridge go upstairs. Um, and for our renter, you know, we let her put her freezer stuff in our freezer downstairs. And then we said, here's a a $75 grocery store gift card, you know, to the local grocery store, you know, like in the grand scheme of things, that's not that much money to keep someone happy, like you said. Yeah, and we like the concept, or at least I do. I think we like the concept of have like touches or interactions with them that aren't only negative. So yeah. when you see them, say hi. Especially Ask how the kids are doing. The um, when they first move in, we give them a, a gift basket of just you know, some treats and things. You know, and our tenants have given us gifts. So that way it's not like, oh, the, the water went or the lights aren't out. And it's always yeah. a negative, negative, negative. It's like, that's not a relationship, even though, you know, it's a business, not a relationship. It's still when you're living with them. They're still your neighbors. But they're still a client. They're still your customer. That's it. That's it. They pay their hard earned money to us every month. It's, you know, like Derek said, putting something into that emotional piggy bank so that later you can draw out of it is always a, helps. a good, it helps. Did you guys ever consider not disclosing that you're the owners of the property and just saying, you know, pretending maybe you're another tenant there or to, you know, maybe you're just the manager of the property? Did you ever consider doing that? I came across it. You know, you read a lot of stuff online and people are like, how do you do this? Even with the lube around, like I was mentioning in trust, and it's like you can kind of hide in the back. <sighs> The general feeling, especially since we live in the house, is you can't really hide. And we feel like, you know, integrity. What are you hiding from? Like being a landlord is is responsibility. That's the word I would choose for landlording. So if you're kind of trying to shirk that responsibility, it's like, well, maybe take a look at why is that interesting to you? Um, you know, what are you trying yeah. to, what are you running from? What are you trying to hide from? Why do you want to, you know, is it that you don't want somebody bothering you? Well, where's the speed bump in that, right? So let's let's find a way through that. We don't want people bothering us after, you know, nine o'clock. Our kids are sleeping now, right? I I personally like my sleep too. Um, so <laughs> find a way around it. Find a way through it. So you set that expectation, yeah, in your lease agreement. Yeah, I don't think I would do that. You know, for me, honesty is the best policy, and it's just it's easier in the long run to be honest about it. Yeah, I was just curious about that because I think that a lot of people choose different ways how to handle that and what works best for them. But yeah, I think that's a a great point as to you can find ways to, you know, say that you are the owner of the property and still set those policies in place so you aren't bothered. And if you are, you know, a decent human being and a good landlord, then there should be no reason that you don't want them to, to know who you are. Well, Noreen and Derek, thank you so much for coming on to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast. We really appreciated hearing your stories and your success with your multifamily property. What is next for you guys? 
What is next? We don't know. <laughs> We don't know. Well, I will say, I will say, um, before we go, I do want to say we've been documenting our journey at our blog, R2 Family. So r2family.com, if anybody wants to see the pictures of our renovations or, you know, what we have to say further about being landlords and how we live for cheap, you know, that's... At, at two cents. Right now, we are kicking around different ideas of possibly moving and we're kind of waiting on God a little bit to just see where he's going to lead us. Um, we did that with this house and it paid huge dividends. So we're not in a rush, but we are keeping our eyes open for what the next deal is, whether we sell this place or keep keep it and get another, you know, we got a couple of kids. We like to have a little bit more space. The city's a little tight. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Keep it in, rent out your unit with your nice low interest rate. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea of another mortgage right now is this is... Um, <laughs> but uh, the nice thing about this situation now eight years later is that we have options, right? And options I didn't think I would ever, I mean, ever come across, um, you know, in terms of the amount of equity that we have in this house. Um, I don't think I ever considered that the rent would go up over time. I thought, okay, that will be our mortgage payment and our taxes will go up and like, we'll just keep pace. And it's not like that. Um, Unfortunately, our taxes did go up, but uh, so did the rent. <laughs> but your rent increased more rapidly than the property taxes said. Yeah, correct. And we did, in retrospect, you know, looking back, we can say, wow, we really bought at the right time um, before the market got really hot. It was it was hot, but it, it got really, really hot in 2020, um, especially around here. And it continues to stay because New York is itself and people are moving out of the city as people always have. You know, after 9-11, people moved out of the city. Back in the 80s, my parents moved out of the city. You know, people always do. Um, but the nice thing is that, like I said, we have options. And I didn't think I didn't think we'd be looking at these options as early as we are. And do you attribute a lot of that to house hacking on this multifamily deal? Absolutely. Yep, taking action. Yeah, taking action Even on it right now, away. When we're looking, it's like, how did we buy this place? Because how do you buy the next one? It's just, it's, it's a little bit of a mystery still to me. I'm like, when do you actually pick up the phone and say, okay we're serious and we're looking now. Like you can look and look and look and look and look and look. So yeah. that's, we'll see. Congratulations on your success. And it's really, you know, inspiring, I think for a lot of people to see that this can be done, especially in New Jersey market. <laughs> and to have that. I have to say this, you have to believe that it's going to happen. You have to decide that this is what it is for you and that it is out there for you. We could have shopped forever and said, oh, well, I guess there's not a two family house for us or maybe well, this is never going to happen for house hacking. But for us, it did happen because we believed it would be. And when we saw this house, I knew in my bones it was ours. And when we put the bid in, I said, I don't care what that number is. I know it's going to be ours. And on Monday, mo on Monday morning, I texted our realtor. I said, so? And he's like, yeah, you won. And I was like, I knew that. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> you know, but you have, to you have to believe that it's so with every ounce of your being. You have to manifest it. That's it. If that, whatever, whatever you, pe whatever people call it, do that. <laughs> We're going to link the information for Noreen and Derek so you guys can reach out to them and find out more information about them. I'm Ashley, and thank you for listening to Real Estate Rookie. We'll see you guys next time. This Bigger Pockets podcast is produced by Daniel Zarati, edited by Exodus Media, copywriting by Calico Content. I'm Ashley, he's Tony, and you have been listening to Real Estate Rookie. And if you want to be a guest on a Bigger Pockets show, apply at biggerpockets.com slash guest. Yeah.